Okay, so we're going to switch to our financial planning topic. And I'm going to try to keep it within the time, but you all know me. So um, you're going to see me looking down a bit because I'm going to be writing on my screen. But today's uh, financial planning topic is four, not four. We're going to cross this out. Five important retirement decisions. So it looks like you can all see my screen here. Yeah. So the first question, of course, is when. When are you considering retiring? Now, this, these all might, some of you might say, this seems so um, obvious, Mark. How can you even be bringing this to us as a certified financial planner and the expert you are? But it's not obvious to everybody, right? So, of course, one of the first questions, and, and honestly, this is why it flipped from four to five. I wasn't going to tell you that, but I'm sharing it with you. Um, I had where and when, but I uh, I thought when des deserved its own category. But it's a decision you have to make. It's not that it, we're talking about important decisions. So some people might have it in their head that, hey, I want to retire at 65. And they've got this thought of, uh, of uh, you know, some of the other areas, you know, how much they're going to need to spend, where the money's coming from. But then they sit down and they, they you know, they, they do their they do their plan, uh, hopefully with a certified financial planner, and it turns out that 65 isn't going to work for what they're doing. Or maybe 62 would work for what they want to do. So when is a big decision to make? You know, uh, especially because it's really hard to go back. We see a lot of people in high paying jobs and, um, and, and uh, significant careers. And often when you leave those positions, it's hard to get hired back if you've made a mistake. Now, I have to tell you, many people um, end up working longer because they do consulting contracts, often for the same job they were doing for the company before, sometimes making more money. But uh, but when, of course, is important. So is it going to be 62? Is it going to be 65? Is it going to be 70? 75? You know, whatever that number works for you, that's fine and good. It gives you a starting point. And it should, of course, be reviewed every year. You're going to hear me talk about this over and over again. But the when is important, of course, because once you stop working, for most people, that significant cash flow stops as well. So if you're used to making $200,000, $300,000, or $100,000 a year, uh, and that spigot's going to stop, then you better make sure that you've got it uh, set up to keep managing your lifestyle off of what you have and what you're planning on coming in. You know, I think back to, we we met a fellow one time uh, who came to us after a class and um, we taught and he said, I just retired, something like, I just retired uh, three months ago uh, and uh, here's what I want to do. I want to, uh, I want to maintain a house in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. I want to maintain a house in South Carolina and one in Florida. And here are my assets and here are my income. And, and, and the, uh, the return back to him was you're going to have to find something. Either you've got to give up one of the places or you've got to go back to work. And that, the situation was where he, he just could not replace that income. He couldn't go back to work. Um, so it would have been better for that individual if he would have had that conversation with us six months prior instead of three months later. Uh, he could have made a more informed decision because, again, these are about this is about decisions. So when, vitally important, seems obvious, but there's a lot to consider there. Where? Where are you going to retire? What's it look like? Um, I had a conversation with, uh, with a client last week, and very happily, I'm, ha I'm so happy for them. They bought a house in South Carolina, and they're talking about Roth conversions. And I said, well, you know, we have to add in state tax. And he said, well, wait a minute. Well, I didn't, I didn't consider that. Well, different rules in different states. So Pennsylvania, we're very fortunate that we don't have any state tax on Roth conversions at this point. New Jersey, up to a level, you don't pay tax on Roth conversions. The level kicks in pretty quickly. But, you know, you've got some room there. There are other states around the country where you don't pay tax on Roth conversions or IRA distributions or pension payments. But there are many I would say most where you do, you pay some level of state tax and it could be significant. So I, I told this individual, we should probably plan on about an additional 7% for your Roth conversions for state tax, 7% in tax for these um, Roth conversions. So where is very important. Now, of course, where gets exciting because I want to be near the grandkids or I want to be, you know, in a warmer climate. That's me. 
I want to, you know, I want to be able to go boating, fishing, whatever. All those things are great and exciting, but you also have to think of the plan effects on that where. So where just as important as the when. Um, how much? How much am I going to need to spend? Again, this seems obvious, but this is so different for everybody. And I have to tell you, in my 20 plus years now of doing this, uh, two, uh, 2012, now 10, 10 years as a certified financial planner and doing intense planning uh, for our clients, uh, most people come in with no idea. Even, you know, I, you've heard me say this for whatever reason, we have a lot of engineers in our practice who are clients. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't advertise to engineers, you know, it's it just, it, they seem to find us. And I love that, by the way, I like, I'm a process oriented person and that makes sense to me. And that's probably the connection there. So the, um, uh, most of our clients will come in and say, here's what I need to spend every year. And I track it on a spreadsheet. Some don't, some say, I, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, we help them find the answer, what they're going to need to spend every year. But even those very detail oriented engineers and doctors who come in with their spreadsheets, I don't think I've ever had a situation where we've said, oh, you were exactly right. <laughs> right. Often they come back most times and probably all the time they come back and they say, uh, you know what? I, uh, I wasn't thinking about this. I wasn't thinking about this and I wasn't thinking about this. Uh, so we've, you know, we've had it where it's a few thousand dollars a month difference. We've had it where it's tens, like a $10,000 a month difference or $15,000 a month difference. And that adds up. So how much you're going to need during retirement is vitally important. And you don't use a, that 4% rule. Don't use a 3% rule. Don't use a rule of thumb that anybody puts out there. That's all bogus. Be very, very careful about using just broad brushes in your retirement planning. Find out what your rate of withdrawal should be. Figure out what it should, you know, what, what your expenses are specifically. If you need help with that, of course, you can reach out to us. But uh, even if you just want to work it out, if you send us an email, um, you, we can send you the spreadsheet that we use. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, and because you have to consider your, your, your spending, of course, and what you want to spend in them. So you have the fun things most of the time, right? Here's the travel we want to do and, um, you know, the, the, the house we want to buy, the boat we want to buy, whatever your, your aspirations are. We're really good, and what you have to what you have to adopt is those other things. Um, you know, the medical costs, inflation, taxes. Of course, taxes is one of your biggest costs during retirement. And you know, hopefully, it's much much smaller for our clients. But uh, most people are just not even considering that. Of course, medical. You hear it all the time about medical costs, but hundreds of thousands of dollars is what you should be setting aside for out of pocket costs of medical. I'm not even talking about if, God forbid, you need long-term care. I'm talking about what the average person pays over a lifetime beyond their Medicare. Of course, inflation. Everybody's talking about inflation now. You know, I had a conversation yesterday with my chiropractor about the price of eggs. Everybody's talking about inflation. So uh, this is, uh, you know, inflation is here forever for sure. Just depending on what level it is, it's very, very painful right now. It's it is it's hard. It's hard to go into the store and you know you used to spend fifty dollars and get a significant amount. Now you, you spend fifty dollars, it feels like you get a block of cheese. But the um, uh, you've got to inflate. There's different inflation for different things. Medical has different inflation. If you're still fund helping you fund college, maybe you're helping your grandkids. That has a different inflation rate. So you've got to pay attention to these different numbers. So inflation. And I talked about taxes, but I'm going to make this bigger because taxes are huge. So hopefully we can help you make them less of a burden. But there are, of course, your regular taxes, your state tax, your, your federal tax, your local tax. Right. So you all know that I served on the school board for eight years here locally and taxes went up almost every year. We had a couple of years that we could keep them at zero increase, but we got lambasted from some people about that. So it's um, you even it's not just your federal tax, your state tax. You know, I talked about uh, how in Pennsylvania we can do Roth conversions with no tax and I qualified IRA distributions come out without tax and um uh, pension payments come out without tax. That's going to change, folks. That we It's unsustainable. And if you ask any legislator who's being honest with you, at some point, that's got to go away. 
Uh, phantom taxes. You know, we've got these things that we know about, state tax, local tax, federal tax, but there are also these phantom taxes. You know, Medicare, anybody who is already on Medicare and um, has a, a significant portfolio, has to take RMDs or whatever, they've already met their Aunt Irma, right? Irma is the income-related monthly adjustment amount that you have to pay for um, your Medicare plan if you earn over a certain amount. And those charts are on our website. They'll be up, by the way, the charts on our website will be updated soon. I like to keep the 20, I have the 2023 charts, but I like to keep the 2022 charts up there until about March because people tend to use them for their um, their tax preparation. The uh, we'll, we'll flip it over, hopefully by the end of March, uh, to the 2023, and then we'll be able to do your tax planning for the year. But, you know, we've got these, these costs can be hundreds of dollars a month. Um, often clients of ours are paying them in the short term while they're doing Roth conversions, and they're never paying them again, hopefully, unless the law changes, right? But, um, uh, but they should be paying less over their lifetime. Often that's significantly less, but People, until you hit that age 65 or whenever you start on Medicare, they don't even have this Irma thought in their mind, right? And they also don't think about those out-of-pocket costs. Um, so for the average person, it's $5,000 plus um, a year, and that comes from uh, that comes straight from Medicare. So that's per individual again. So that's another $10,000 a year that you just might not be considering can be as high as $15,000 a year that you might not be considering. So that's out-of-pocket cost of Medicare. These are these phantom taxes. And then of course, this Irma. How about investment costs? You know, we work really hard in our portfolio to keep investments down, investment costs down as low as possible because I, listen, I realize the drag of that. Um, but, you know, not everybody does that. And it's, I was just at a, um, uh, an education event, and we dug into these, some of these investment costs. And I was really surprised to see the net cost effect on just some traditional mutual funds can range four to six percent a year. Um, that is uh, a significant amount. Think about what you have to overcome. So even if even if you're ranging, you know, three to six, call it that, right? But again, some of them are just blew my mind. Mutual funds. So um, uh, even if it's just three percent. So to earn 10%, of course, you first have to overcome that 3%. You know, we charge, we, you know, we start at 1%. So they add that on there. Uh, you've got to understand the investment expenses. Uh, of course, as accounts get larger, we reduce our, uh, our fees. But um, uh, as, uh, as your investments grow, you've got to be aware of these expenses because you've got to have a way to overcome them or reduce them. I'm a big fan of reducing them. And there's many ways to do that. How is this funded? Where is our money coming from? Boy, if, if there was a top three questions I get every time I sit down with a new client, uh, and often, you know, as we're in year two, year three with clients, where is this money coming from? How is this funding? Okay, now you've told me, now I understand how much I need to spend, right? My spending is here. I know when, we're good, I got that. I know where, I know how much we have to spend. Now, where's it coming from? I'm not used to this. I'm used to earning my paycheck. I save some, I spend some. I get that, I understand that change. Now I've got this big bunch of money. Where's it all coming from? That is, uh, that is a big one. And you've got to make these decisions. So the decisions you make, especially early in retirement about where your funds are coming from, can make a significant impact in the life of your retirement. Remember, what you're planning for today is going to have this ripple impact for the next 30, 35 years. Well, of course, some of it could be from income. So whether it's pension, um, Social Security, uh, you might have real estate investments that that pay. You might work part time. You might work part time. So some of that could come from from uh, income. Most people have you know this kind of thing. Investment types. They have some stocks. They have some bonds. They have cash. They might have an annuity or two or more. Um, and these are typically in the form stocks, bonds, and cash are typically in the forms of mutual funds or exchange traded funds. 
So that's all well and good. And people come to us and have these big piles of things all over the place. And they're working with somebody for the last 30 years. And that person has done a good job of taking them from point A all the way up to point B. And they've had a lot of growth in their accumulation years. Now they're at point B. So this has been 40 years, let's say. And now they say, well, point C over here, uh, let's see, I'm going to put it over here and we're going to cross over. Point C over here is when I'm no longer here, right? Rest in peace. So for the next 30 some years, 30 to 35 years, maybe plus, I've got to figure out where this is all coming from, the stocks, bonds, and cash, and it's all kind of just this mesh. I got different accounts all, there, all over different places. Uh, you know, how does this all come together? So that's a really, really important decision. You've heard me talk about asset allocation, principal protection, account segmentation. This is where that plan and the account segmentation comes in. Because again, what you really want, folks, is you want to start with retirement and go back to that uh, no longer here and have that plan instead of just one big mesh of stocks, bonds, and cash, annuities, real estate, gold, silver, whatever your investments are saying, okay, this is going to cover me. Let's hope it works. You know, and, you're, and the professionals saying, trust us, we have a lot of great tools to show, show us the ebbs and flows in the market, and we, we stress test them and use this sophisticated Monte, Car Monte Carlo uh, scenarios that, that, you know, are based on uh, nuclear physics, and that's all true, right? But that's just really falling back to trust us. So, you know, really what you want is you want to, now you've identified, you know, when, where, how much money you need. Now you just say, okay, I need this much money here. I need this much money here. I need this much money here. And I need this much money here. And you develop a plan for each segment. This is when I'm talking about account segmentation. You plan, you, you, you don't have one big account or, you know, an IRA account, a non-qualified account, a non-IRA account because they're taxed differently. That's important, right? But you've got to know where the money's flowing from because they have to be invested in the right things, right? The right investments and also at the right risk levels. Because if this is years zero to three, and I didn't draw this out, years four to six, years seven to nine, and I know you folks have seen this before, but I, it's so important. Years 10 to 13, for example, and 13 plus years, all these, all these pie charts have to be invested differently. All these separate accounts, and that yes, they must be separate accounts because psychologically, you have to understand that when the market drops 40%, your cash flow for the next three years is barely affected if affected at all. Where the volatility you're seeing is in the 13 plus years. So that's what keeps people invested because you need, you need these longer term investments to, to hedge off inflation. And it also gives the people comfort to enjoy their retirement. So it's all great to know what investment types, but you got to know where they sit too. I hope that's helpful. And then, of course, we have the tax treatment. So you've got your buckets. You all know these buckets by now, right? You've got your taxable. So you, you're all getting 1099s from your taxable bucket. So any 1099 that doesn't have the letter R under it comes from the taxable bucket. And sometimes this is significant money that comes out of here. And what happens there? You have to pay tax on it. And then you have your tax deferred bucket. And these are IRAs, traditional IRAs, traditional 401ks, other retirement plans that you haven't paid tax on yet and you're promising to pay tax later. And then you have your tax-free bucket. Tax advantaged or tax-free. And that's anything Roth and some forms of ca properly structured cash value life insurance. So anything that comes out of here is tax-free. Uh, there, there can be some requirements on that, of course, but anything out of here, the center bucket, you've got to pay tax on later. So you've got to have that. another vital decision is how much money is in each bucket. And there is an ideal amount, as you know, for each of these buckets, right? It should be six months to one year of expenses in this bucket. And you can, if you can keep money in this tax deferred bucket, it is an amount that, that generates a required minimum distribution that is below your standard deduction so that any distributions that come out of here are tax free. Now, that doesn't work for everybody because you might have pensions and real estate investments and, and, and too much money over here. But 
for, for some people, you can leave 250000 300000 sometimes $500,000 in your tax-deferred bucket and never pay tax on it. So be careful about getting too aggressive with your conversions and making the wrong decision. So that is a vital decision. So we can move money over here and build up. We want, ideally you want everything, right? Everything that's, that doesn't meet these minimums, minimum amounts in this tax-free bucket. So anything that comes out of here is 0% tax. Another vital decision. Now the last one here is your legacy. So you gotta ask, if there is a legacy, you might want to spend it all. You might, you might say, I want to have $1 left when I'm no longer above ground. That's fine. What typically happens when we go through that account segmentation process, taking you back to here, we end up here. I'm going to make this green just to make it a little easier to see. We end up here with a column of money that is what we call legacy longevity. And listen, this could be, what if this is a million dollars? And you might say, I want to die with one, $1 left, you know, when I'm no longer here. Um, and that might be fine. And that's, that might be a good plan for you. But if we show you that, hey, you know, it, you've met, we're meeting all your needs here, invest it the way we should be. And then you've got a million dollars left here that will likely, you'll, you won't need during your lifetime. Now you can pull it out of there if you find things that you want to do with it, right? So you spend that money down, um, whether it's medical costs or just fun, whatever you want to do. Um, or it could go to your legacy, whatever that is. So the, another great thing about the account segmentation is it identifies if there is that legacy longevity portion and what that is. Because you can imagine it, if we typically have this being the most aggressive allocation. So if this averaged, even if it averaged 7% a year, that million dollars is going to double every 10.2 years. So you, you could easily go from a million dollars to three plus million dollars over your the, the life of your retirement. Uh, and many times that's many multiples over that. So you got to figure out how much is in your legacy longevity portion. And then, um, uh, so if you're going to have a legacy, what is it? And then if you have money left over, if you don't spend it all until, you know, that last dollar on the day you die, uh, who does it go to? You know, does it go to family, friends, charity? This is all very important because there are different uh, strategies for each one of these. Let's just talk charity. When somebody tells me that they're charitably inclined and say they have $3 million in an IRA and we do all the projections and we show that a million dollars is likely in that legacy longevity and they say, well, you know, I'd like to, I don't have any children. I'm a single person. I don't have any children or, you know, it's just the two of us and we don't have any kids, whatever the situation is. We want it to go to this charity. If there's really that million dollars left there, Mark, we want that this to go to this charity. Well, we wouldn't even consider converting that to a Roth IRA if it's going to go to a charity. Why would I pay tax on something for a client or have a client pay tax? I don't pay tax for clients. Don't don't take that the wrong way. But why would I have clients pay tax on something that no one's ever going to have to pay tax on, right? Now, if they had to draw it out and use it during their lifetime in a, in a um, uh, you know, some kind of medical situation or something, that's a different story. But let's say that that's earmarked towards charity. They can gift that during their lifetime or they can leave it at their legacy and pay no tax. That's why that is another key decision to make. You can't make these decisions without having all the information. You have to go through the plan and go through these processes. But do you see how that's important? Family and friends is different too, because, hey, listen, you might want to help them have a, a tax, tax free or a tax efficient transfer of that money, right? Because we, we know, folks, that taxes are only going up. All the studies we show is that by 2030, your average middle class American is going to be in a 40 to 45% effective tax rate. And that's a lot more than it is today. And then how, of course. So we have if, who, and how. How does it all transfer? Are we using, um, are we doing it during a lifetime? Are we doing a gifting strategy? Are we waiting till we, we die? Are we doing it in a trust? Are we just doing bequests? There's a lot of hows there. That's really where you need your team. You need your certified financial planner. You need your qualified estate attorney, probably an elder law attorney. You know, those two being can be the same person. Your CPA how does that all work? Once you've identified it, right, that funnels down. Okay, we've got what we need. Now we've got this legacy. It's going to happen, 
right? You're, you're going to die at some point. How does it all transfer over? You need the help and the, um, the, uh, the tools to make that decision. You can't make the decision without the information. These are cr critical pieces of information to help you make these decisions better. And then, so the hows, very, very important. So trust, uh, in life, after, after death, uh, bequests, whichever works best for you. Life insurance, then the why. Why is this part of the uh, retirement planning process? Well, I've already told you because what if you have $1 million in your legacy longevity segment? Um, wouldn't it be helpful to know that? Wouldn't it be terrible if you go through this Roth conversion process, try to do it on your own, and you said, I have $3 million in my IRA. I'm going to convert it all before the end of uh, um, 2030 because I've read the books. I've heard, I've, I've listened to Mark's webinars. You know, uh, his his colleague, Ed Slot, David McKnight says we should convert it. And there's a million dollars that you never had to convert. So listen, even if you're fortunate and you're, you're, um, you're, you're in a, you maintain a 20% effective tax rate, it's $200,000 that you never had to spend, and that would be terrible. So there's a lot of whys around it, but that's the why of why it's important that make this decision in the retirement planning process, not the estate planning process. Everybody thinks about a legacy as the estate plan, but it's also vitally important in your retirement plan. All right, folks, that wraps up today. Uh, that was a good... Um, uh, long session. So we're at 1056. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar. It will not be next week. I'm out of town next week. So our next webinar will be the following Tuesday. Uh, but I hope this was helpful. If, uh, if you're just tuning in or if you tuned in just for this segment, please subscribe and uh, like and hit the notification button and all those things you do on YouTube. Um, if, uh, if you have questions, send them to me. Uh, if you want a copy of our spreadsheet, um, send me an email and we'll get it out to you. If you want to schedule time to meet with us to go over your key questions, your five, not four, but key retirement questions, have to schedule time to do that. Just email us at questions at AttleboroWealth.com. That's questions at AttleboroWealth.com. We got a lot coming up for this year. It's really going to be an exciting year. It's kind of overwhelming because we have so much planned, but you know we've got uh, classes, two classes scheduled already. We've got a few more scheduled for the rest of the year. We've got some really great people who have joined our firm that are going to be running classes and um, helping us out. And then we've got Dave, Dave McKnight, uh, March 1st on our uh, special webinar, our first special webinar of the year. We've got Dave and uh, Ed Slot, kind of the dream team on May 16th live in the Newtown Theater. So I don't know where you are, but if you can make it here, that would be great. I know some of you from around the country, but listen, fly in for this. <laughs> it will be really worth your time. If you're close by for crying out loud, don't miss it. Um, you know, we do some light catering and, uh, you know, if you're still hungry after this catering, I'd be shocked. But um, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, leave me some comments. Uh, send me some emails. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about the studio. Let me know what you think about the YouTube format. Let me know if you think it's great. If it stinks, I appreciate all the feedback. Folks, have a great week and we'll see you in two weeks, not next week, but two weeks. Take care now.